one second. Session number three, um, and it's, uh, I'm very excited to welcome this uh, panel on um, training. And uh, so we have um, a range of speakers that are looking at training, how to train uh, academics and information professionals and also the general public. So this is, session was uh, proposed by the IIPC Training Working Group, and this is one of three training, uh, one of three working group sessions that we're going to have over the next two days. So two more are coming up tomorrow. So this is teaching the ways and hows of creating and using web archives. So I'm going to start off by asking the speakers in the order that they're on the program to give a little introduction to an uh, overview of what their talks are. You can see the full version of their talks on the Vimeo. And then I'm going to take some questions in that order as well. So first up, I'm going to welcome, um, so we have uh, Tim. Tim, can you uh, give us your summary of your talk, please? Yeah, sure can. Uh, good morning slash afternoon slash evening <laughs> uh, to you all. Uh, so um, my video or my presentation, my talk, um, we took a look at training a couple different groups of users, uh, some material derived from um, web archives. So in the first case, it was a fourth year communications class uh, uh, entitled Business Communications. And the, the point of one of the seminar weeks was to analyze some information that was harvested uh, during the COVID uh, time in a uh, archive that we created. So we had a derivative of that data. We pushed it out into a CSV file. Then we wrapped it up into a uh, Jupyter notebook on the Colab platform and ran the class uh, discussion session around this notebook. Uh, it was about 12, 13 students, all in fourth year, uh, not programmers, right? So that's the whole thrust behind all of this. How did we communicate to um, non, a, pro, a non programming crowd? That um, session was marked with, uh, let's say, um, you know, limited success. Uh, the students were kind of um, trying to figure out exactly what it was we were trying to communicate to them as opposed to sort of like digging into the archival content. Uh, so that was the, the first initiative. The second initiative, um, we did a uh, general purpose, uh, here's how you can do some analysis with web archives. Uh, once again, hosted on the Google Colab platform, um, thrown out to a wide audience. And we were using uh, the meme generator data set from LC Labs with some uh, information um, added into it. Um, the good news is this second session that we ran or second initiative we went through went off a lot better because I think we used better components of the notebooks. Um, we actually started to use uh, some widgets um, generated automatically from the CoLab environment. Uh, so that really reduced the amount of sort of programming code that users and participants needed to look through, which I think really um, uh helped us gain some uh, some progress. Uh, I will mention the um, research in these sessions were made possible by the Archives Unleashed cohort program. So I want to say thanks to that for, for, our, for that support for last year. And then in terms of next steps, we've won another grant at my institution to do effectively some A-B testing of uh, computational notebooks to see how we can make them easier for non-programmers to um, understand and work through and derive results and all those sorts of things. But yeah, that's a summary of what uh, what we came up with. And yeah, I'll hand it over to the next speaker and looking forward to questions later on. Thanks, Tim. So hi, Carolina. Hi, Inge. Uh, so if you want to give a quick summary of your talk as well, please. Sure, thank you. Um, our presentation actually was um, an overview uh, of our activities and trainings that we have conducted um, in the last 13 uh, years in the library. Uh, we started uh, our trainings mainly for librarians in 2009 uh, within the training center for uh, continuing education for librarians and information uh, information. Uh, professionals. Um, the, those activities were related to raising awareness uh, of the existence of web archiving, uh, web archives, so why is it important to archive the web, uh, how, who is doing it in the world, uh, how uh, we are doing it uh, uh, in Croatia. Uh, those trainings were 
uh, took place twice a year for uh, five to 15 persons uh, attendees uh, and were um, held in person. Um, uh, as our new activity is creating local uh, historic web collections, uh, we recently, uh, actually last year, uh, held a few trainings uh, uh, for uh, librarians in public libraries um, to teach them uh, of the processes uh, for creating uh, um, uh, uh, local historic collections uh, as uh, thematic harvesting, let's say. Uh, that and uh, now we are focused on uh, inclusion of the wider community. We have a great uh, collaboration uh, within the library with our uh, information specialists. Um, so the plan is to train them to uh, so they could spread the word uh, about our archives, about archiving, uh, and further educate researchers, uh, students and other users how to uh, search and use uh, our, our archive. Um, and that's, that's about it for now. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna pass over to Shishu if you want to give us an overview of your presentation, please. It's me, right? Yeah, Hi. sorry, um, <laughs> it's like the same right? <laughs> No worries. This is Drew Wuxi uh, from Virginia Tech uh, Libraries. Uh, so our project is founded by uh, an IMLS, the Laura Bush 21st Century uh, library, Librarian Program. Uh, the target audience of our training program are um, um, working librarians and archi archivists who are uh, relatively familiar with uh, web archiving. So this program are uh, may be considered as uh, advanced topics in web archiving. And the purpose of this program is to actually connecting the tool developers, uh, those people who developed advanced tools uh, to use web archives, to analyze web archives with um, people uh, in the field who wants to learn more about how to use those tools. Um, so we have a little bit of assumption on uh, the target audience, uh, the, although they are not programmers, uh, we assume they are at least uh, they have the basics uh, in their hands and they are also not afraid of looking reading the the command lines and or uh, at least to follow some of the command lines so these are our assumptions and the program had been uh, i would say uh, pretty successful uh, we have 37 people joining the in-person training workshop that's in 2019 um, right before the pandemic. Uh, then uh, during the pandemic, uh, we managed to revise the uh, workshop in a format that everything has been recorded to allow people to follow the, uh, the typing uh, and repeat watching the videos as ma many uh, times as they, they want. Uh, so our second round of uh, virtue uh, workshop attracted more than 100 people, although I, I wasn't able to uh, have a lot of feedback from, from this group because people uh, watch the videos offline. Uh, so the program has now completed and all the videos and training materials are now all freely online. Thank you very much. So thank you. And we're off to our last speaker now. Christy, if you could give an overview of your talk, please. Hi everyone. Um, so uh, yeah, my talk uh, explored a series of workshops that I ran in 2020. Um, it emerged from my PhD research. I was doing a community heritage uh, PhD project at UCL in London. Um, and uh, I was someone who was sort of simultaneously situated between activist spaces and um, archival networks um, and I I guess as initially as an experiment um, ran um, a couple of workshops which um, were run on a sliding scale basis and which were marketed as basic introduction to web archiving skills for DIY cultures or activist communities um, and uh, that sort of initial couple of workshops gathered quite a lot of momentum and ended up developing into um, a series of iterations of the workshop over a summer period um, that were uh, attended by I think around 140 people um, uh, and were de 
delivered online, accessible on um, um, a sliding scale basis, meaning, you know, between costing between nothing and a higher price, depending on the socioeconomic circumstances of participants. Um, so yeah, my presentation was a reflective um, uh, presentation and account of that experience. Um, it is something that um, I immediately did and um, certainly uh, given the resources I had access to as a PhD student, I think it went very successfully. Um, it's something that I have subsequently uh, developed in a number of pathways. So it's, um, for instance, I've recently worked with the Archives and Records Association to deliver um, uh, small training packages around basic skills and web archiving and also scaling up and planning a web archiving program. So it's sort of developed in that direction for a more information professional audience um, and I'm now in post in an iSchool at Manchester Metropolitan University so I'm looking now towards developing it through uh, putting in a, a grant to develop it into a project which is not just run by me I guess <laughs> um, so yeah um, that's I think all of uh, all I can say to introduce it. That's great. So I've got a couple of general questions for the panel and I'm going to start with the first speaker and then after we go through the answers for everyone, then we'll go reverse order again. So uh, Tim, you're up first and for the first question for the panel is, what was the awareness level like for web archives when you started doing, delivering your training? Do you think that there was a high level of awareness, low level or was it a very mixed bag? So uh, Tim, go ahead. Sure. Happy to answer that. In the first case with the communications seminar, um, we had a, a pre-activity that we wanted the students to go through, which introduced the idea of what our archives, web archives were, what kind of insights you can get out of them, and sort of how they're structured. Um, the class, as I mentioned, we had about a dozen students. They did not do the pre-class uh, uh, activity. Uh, it wasn't attached to the grade book in any way, so it was just, uh, you know, you take it for what it's worth. So we had to spend a lot of our limited 40 minutes, let's say, um, introducing what it is we were actually looking at. Here's a CSV file which represents some data which was gathered from a web archive and working through it. So it was quite a sharp curve. I think by the end of the session, enough students were understanding what was going on to sort of um, you know, have a little light bulb moment. And the second example with the uh, web archive, uh, we had a, a web archive training session, pardon me, we had a, a lot more time. So we were able to dig into exactly what a work file was and all that kind of stuff. And generally that crowd had a more of a background in what we were talking about. So we saw a lot of nodding heads going through that, but it was certainly between those two experiences <laughs> right across the board, nothing at all versus some grounding, which made things a lot easier. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how I'll answer that. So the same question for you guys, uh, Carolina and Inge. Well, our experience is that uh, although we are uh, having our archive uh, for 18 years uh, and we are doing the trainings for uh, 13 years, uh, the awareness is still uh, very low. Um, why is that? We, are, we, are, uh, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. We are really trying. Uh, but... Um, but um, uh, that that's how, how it is, but it's not all uh, it's not all uh, uh, bad. We have some uh, surprises uh, from the students from uh, the Faculty of Philosophy, uh, from uh, students from linguistics, where they're uh, aware of our archive, aware how they they could use uh, it, and so. That was really a good uh, good example for us, and we're very happy that we could hear something like this. Yeah, but in general, not not so good. Yeah, and um, I think it's a common problem for a lot of people in web archives. <laughs> uh, Z. Sure, um, I, I would resonate with uh, our colleagues' uh, impression. Uh, of course, the general awareness uh, among the general audience is not as high as we want it to be. Uh, our program, uh, I don't know, it's fortunate or unfortunate, we're preaching to the already converted. So uh, the, the, um, so we run a survey to, to the um, people who attended the in-person training session. Uh, we ask people uh, uh, 
on a scale of one to five, one being a novice and five being an expert, uh, where do you put yourselves in there? Uh, our response are about 10% put them in number one, and the vast majority, 43% and 40% put them in number two and three. The smaller, very small uh, number of people put them on four and five. So uh, the general audience uh, could, could be uh, considered, uh, they're not novice, and they know something about web archiving, and many people would be very comfortable in, in dealing with web archives. Uh, but very few will call themselves expert, and that's probably out of uh, some kind of uh, modesty. Mm -hmm. right, thank you. That's quite interesting. And uh, Kirsty, same question for you then. Um, yeah, I, I definitely resonate with a lot that has been um, said by, by colleagues here. Um, I think I didn't um, take any efforts to kind of measure the level of um, uh, awareness that people had when they attended my workshops. Um, I I did generally ask uh, in one of the first group exercises, what was your motivation for coming along um, instead of getting people to um, sort of position themselves. Um, and I would say based on those reflections, the majority of people were kind of just at the starting point and looking for um, an entry point I guess into web archiving work um, either via you know um, involvement in perhaps activist heritage projects um, uh, there were a lot of people that kind of attended and were quite familiar with how community heritage um, worked in terms of collecting and managing paper records but you know had just never really understood even how to get going with uh, web heritage um, and the same for born digital materials as well. Um, so I'd say, you know, generally it was lower. Um, there were some people who'd kind of taken those first steps and were um, uh, coming along looking for more of a refresher um, as well, but generally towards the lower end. So for the second question, we're gonna go in reverse order. So Kirsty, you're up first this time. And um, so as this session is organized by the IIPC Training Working Group, um, you might be aware that they've published uh, beginners resources for training on web archives. And they're wondering what resources would you have found it useful for them to have provided for you when you're putting together your training sessions? Um, I guess from the sort of position of um, where I'm located now as, um, uh, in a university teaching context, um, I think uh, for me, it's always the question of which aspects of web archiving to focus on um, and perhaps scaling, scaling that at um, an appropriate level. So obviously what I was doing initially was just, you know, dipping your feet in the water. But um, I think um, for me, um, looking forward what would be helpful would be you know the ways in which to theme future sessions um i will say you know following in the subsequent years um i have found the beginners training guidance that you've put together really helpful so um i think those are already great resources but that's the way i take it andy uh, I would also resonate there, and the, the resources put up uh, uh, by IEPC has been very uh, helpful. Uh, in our particular case, uh, the most uh, valuable resource I would actually say is our people, uh, the people who um, spend their time uh, not only develop the tools, but also develop the training modules with us, and those are precious uh, resources. It's very hard to get their attention. It's very hard to... Uh, 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 well, they, they understand the importance of training people, uh, but then group them together into a, a, a universal um, a curriculum uh, and interact with the trainees. That's a very important uh, resources. I would say it's also a very rare opportunity to interact with the people who develop the tools. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, same question for you, uh, Carolina and Inge. Uh, yes, well, we, we, in our training and courses, we are providing information who is archiving the web, but um, uh, some updated informations about uh, 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 who is archiving the web, uh, um, uh, 
it it will it will it will be very useful and maybe to put some um, uh, map on the IPC website uh, to show how many countries in the world uh, uh, archive the web. And last but not least, Tim. So um, I'll echo comments made that, yeah, the training material provided is, is excellent already. I, I think in the use case that I found myself in, um, sort of explaining how you grab a website, put it into a, a web archive, harvest that in a large, and then create sort of like a derivative tabular data set out of that. I think if there's some way to do that, I guess that's the million dollar question in terms of like a three minute video, a two minute video that resonates with users and that has a brief post assessment. I think that would be the golden, you know, the golden egg. That is a very, you know, specific request that I would love to see happen. And perhaps, you know, uh, someday I'll, I'll sit down with a colleague and try to put that together. But yeah, I think that was one of the things as I think the theme we're, we're landing on here is, you know, making sure the user knows exactly what it is that we're looking at, you know, hands waved, and then we get into the thing where we're actually using that information. I think going through that transition is the tricky part of all of this, but yeah. Before we go into the next question, Tim, you're going to be up first this time. Um, just everybody, please put questions into the chat if you've got anything you'd like to pick up or what uh, the speakers are um, highlighting, because um, we'd love to hear more from you as well. Um, also just even hearing if it's the same common issues um, that everybody's facing is quite useful. And um, so question three we have is, uh, when were you develop when you were developing your training materials, did you assess what prior knowledge or skills the intended audience required for these sessions? Um, so as I alluded to in the, in the sort of two situations, in the first one, we had that class where we asked students to do a pre-class um, pre activity and not well, not many of them did. Uh, so that was our attempt to sort of set the stage. Um, what we're going to do is work with the professor running the class, and I hope next year be able to attach some amount of participation uh, mark or assessment to the final grade, which I think will increase engagement. Um, conversely, in the sort of generic or the, the archive analysis workshop that we ran with a larger crowd, we didn't in fact do any kind of pre-assessment before we got in, but we did take an opportunity, as I was saying, we had enough time to sort of introduce some activities, stop, do a sort of formative assessment as we were going along, and we got pretty good results based on that, but looking at uh, people's um, you know, uh, affiliations and their positions, we kind of had a crowd that was a little bit more familiar with what web archives were, so it was good to it was a real contrast between these two environments with respect to the sort of what people knew. And uh, next time we'll certainly, I think, do some pre-assessment a little bit more and try to engage with our learners in a way that gets them to actually do the material. But yeah, that's what we found anyways. Thanks, uh, Carolina and uh, Inge. So uh, since uh, our audience is mainly uh, are mainly librarians from diverse types of uh, libraries, uh, we uh, and we when we uh, started uh, trainings, we were teaching uh, them how to catalog and how to select and every uh, of every activities of the uh, web archiving that we are providing in our archive. Uh, we will uh, we only ask ask them to know the. Uh, cataloging in general and to have some uh, um, uh, experience in computer use, not, nothing else. Okay, thanks, Inzi. Um, we didn't uh, run a pre-assessment, but we did have assumptions, uh, which is implied in our call for participation, and that is people have some interest in web archiving. If they don't already have the fundamentals knowledge, uh, we prepared uh, pre-recorded videos on, uh, um, on this prerequisite that people can watch uh, at their own time before the joining. And also, like I uh, mentioned before, the assumption is people are not afraid of looking at a command line and they're invited to actually try some of the command line uh, with uh, the trainers uh, during the training session. Uh, that's pretty much what we have. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Christy? Um, 
yeah the so i did um i didn't run any sort of pre um workshop um activities to kind of gauge this um but i did make assumptions um in the development of the training um and in the way i marketed it so i made it um very clear that it was set at the level for basically anyone who had an interest in web archiving but there was no requirement for anyone to have done any archival work of any type before um it was sort of uh, communicated in a way um uh that you know i tried to make it kind of as open as possible um and in when i went on then to develop the course content um the workshop content i uh, used that to kind of inform how it was developed in terms of how I explained terms, how I introduced the idea of web archiving. So basically um, setting it at a, po a point where I assumed there was no existing knowledge um, because we, you know, as a sort of uh, a cohort, everyone would be coming from different sort of levels of knowledge. So yeah, starting from that point. So I'm going to take a couple of questions from the audience and to start off, uh, Tim, there's just a few questions for you. So one question is, are the recordings for your session available? And um, I know that some other sessions are available online. So if you have anything available online, pop them into the chat for um, everybody to look at. And then um, and second question for you, Tim, then is, please, could you talk a bit about how you find the right balance between exposing your students to the code versus making it accessible for them? Excellent question. So I'm going to uh, drop a few links in the chat box, but I'll just summarize. Um, one will go to the workshop landing page, which has a recording of the session, as well as a link to fire up the uh, Google Colab notebook that we used for the session. Another link will be the um, notebook for the communications class that allows you to fire up the, um, uh, the, the, the notebook and collab. That's what I'm trying to say. And then uh, I'll also drop in a link to the project more generally where we're keeping track of all of the milestones for the different things we're, we're doing. So then to answer the second question, it was very tricky to find a good balance because we didn't want to scare people off or sort of make them think they needed to know code in order to, you know, engage with the data. So that was quite a challenge. Uh, I think when we moved from, we did the first, the, the comm seminar in the fall, and then we did the larger workshop in the winter. When we moved to the winter, we um, made heavier use of widgets in the collab environment that allowed you just to do, a, you know, pick from a drop down list and hit a button to sort of see examples of the data. So I think that really helped put people at ease because they weren't looking at Python code line by line. They were able to generate you know, visualizations, pie graphs based on categories that were selected from drop down boxes. And I think that went a long way into um, making the users feel more at ease with analyzing the data. And as I said, we're going to pick up a grant, like we're working on a grant project. We'll, we'll, we'll dig into this more in depth. We'll, we'll talk to experts about, you know, how a notebook should look and then look at how users interact with it. So yeah, certainly an, an exciting field for us and looking forward to getting some more results with respect to that. So the next question is for um, Kirsty, and um, so it's uh, you mentioned a few times. Sorry, it's just moved. You mentioned a few times of the marketing of your workshops outside the information sector. How did you go about marketing, and were you using personal contacts in the musical music industry in Manchester? Um, yeah. So um, my marketing approach. Um, so I should say that. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm sort of working in Manchester, but I've lived um, across the UK in a number of different sort of cities with quite strong activist networks. So London, Leeds, um, and I've it, from sort of involvement in activist groups myself kind of got quite a lot of personal networks um, in various social movements. Um, so uh, my marketing approach was a mixture of, you know, myself circulating uh, the event via a number of uh, listservs that were um, uh, specific, um, uh, sort of relevant to uh, specific areas, um, and uh, using social media. Um, I also sort of encouraged people to use um, uh, what, um, when I've been involved in 
trade um, unions over here, we sort of talked about a spider wing, which is, you know, if you um, basically getting word out by um, asking anyone who sees it to who thinks you know that they might know someone who's interested to pass it on um so it's it i wouldn't say it's a sort of formal formalized marketing strategy in any way but it was very successful um it in terms of the attendees um uh it wasn't you know the the sort of event made it as far as um, people in the Philippines, people in America, Canada. So, you know, via that sort of network approach, um, the word did get out there. Um, I wish I had better ways to sort of map how the word got to those places. But um, for me, I guess m the sort of marketing I approach took, it's just a multiple pronged approach really of, um, you know, uh, putting the event in various spaces um obviously because it was an online event i used predominantly online spaces if i was sort of developing it as an uh perhaps a practical in-person workshop at this point in time i'd also think about um using you know very simple methods like putting up posters in specific community spaces etc um uh to reach people but um i think a certain amount of the success did come from my initial networks um so i think making contacts um or you know having connections that you can reach out to to ask them to circulate um within specific targeted communities is always helpful um but that's the approach i took with it that's great and uh, caroline and then get a question for you so in your talk you refer to hair tricks as capturing tool is the course for local libraries limited to raising awareness and working to selection and is capture centrally organized using hair tricks or do librarians get instructions sorry it's just moved <laughs> uh, or do librarians get instructions for using all kinds of free tools uh, well, uh, in those type of trainings, we want to uh, actually uh, teach them about um, awareness and selection and we want uh, to include them to come and collaborate with us. So we don't, uh, we, we just mentioned the processes that we are doing in, in creating those thematic harvestings and we mentioned the heretrix, but we don't go to uh, too much into the technical um, part because uh, uh, in creating uh, those types of uh, 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 collections, uh, we are uh, doing the, um, everything that's that's uh, connected with tools. So they are just nominating the the, the uh, your uh, websites. Yes. So we try to. Um, we mention everything that is going on in the world and uh, and uh, in Croatia, but don't uh, don't go uh, further into technical details and don't show them how heretic works because we want to because they will, will be scared in our yeah. experience. <laughs> yeah. So I hope that uh, we answered the question. Oh yeah, you know, very good. And uh, so one more question uh, for Tim is about the data set preparation for the for your workshops that you ran. Were you relying on tools that students could then run themselves later, or was there other cleanup work that you need to do? And um, so this question comes in from Laura Werbel, who says that this has been a big challenge she's had with work at running data workshops generally. Yeah, absolutely. I agree that it is. A large challenge. Um, the way we've structured things, and we we kind of do a lot of work in the Google Colab space and using notebooks. And you have to be mindful of when you set these things up about how they ingest information. So you have to take a like a CSV file, put it in a GitHub repository, and one of the top cells of your notebook. Sorry, if you know you're unfamiliar with notebooks, I encourage you to take a look at them. Uh, you ingest the CSV file and then you perform some analysis on it. Um, you know, that CSV file then can't be that large because you're going to wait on, you know, ingesting that file in the collab environment and it just sort of uh, takes up a lot of time. The, the other thing to keep in mind too is um, when you're running the cells in a notebook, if you get out of order or if you skip a cell, there's a chance you'll, you know, uh, encounter an unrecoverable problem with someone is trying to parse through the error messages and click, click, click and all that. So 
we tried to make our notebooks as bulletproof as possible, as I'll, as I'll describe. So like if you hit the button sequentially, everything should work. And, you know, no cell relies on a cell higher up. So particularly with the data set that we put together for the uh, general um, uh, webinar, we used the meme generator data set, then we enriched it a couple of times. So we added in extra columns of data from like, you know, language detection and actual like meme scores retrieved from an API. And we had to craft the notebooks in a very particular way so that it would work. So I encourage you to check out that link I shared for the, the comp or the, the, um, the actual activity where you ingest the notebook. That one took, you know, a lot of us clicking on this. Will this break if someone does this? And it was, uh, it was, gen yeah, it was quite a bit of uh, work to, to set it up, but fortunately we didn't have any learners drop off because of problems. So it's worth the effort in other words. But. Helena, you're muted. So thank you. <laughs> so uh, we're going to wrap up now. So I'm going to ask one last question to Z. Um, if you could tell us what was the biggest lesson that you learned from developing either the training materials or in the way you delivered the training? What's the biggest lesson that was learned from that process? I would say the biggest lesson is to practice and uh, repeat, uh, practice, review, and repeat, repeatedly uh, improve the process. Uh, we did three rounds of uh, practice uh, before we delivered the whole thing uh, to, to in-person workshop. Then we made a major change to bring this online in a pre-recorded fa uh, fashion. So all of these are out of practice and uh, improvements. That's great. That's really good lessons learned. And there's more chats in there. We didn't get uh, questions. We didn't get a chance to get to. So I think the um, presenters, you can answer them directly. You can type in answers to ones that are directed at you specifically. So um, just before we wrap up, though, Claire, I just want to give a couple of words about the IFC training working group. Hi. Yeah. So as Helena mentioned, we this um, session was um, brought together by the um, co-chairs of the um, IPC training working group. Um, I just want to say thank you to Lauren, um, Lauren Baker from Library of Congress, um, one of my co-chairs who did the initial reaching out to people uh, and doing all the work at that end and putting together the proposal. Um, thank you to the panelists for agreeing to take part. It's been really great. Um, and also a plug for the um, training working group materials. Um, I will put a link in the chat um so they are online free for anybody to use and we ran a session last week during the general assembly where we were um revi just revising those sessions for um factual accuracy hopefully the revised ones will be online i'm going to say end of june hopefully um but there's a lot of annual leave in the meantime but hopefully they'll be online by end of june please go ahead and use them and we're very keen to get your feedback and to hear how you've been using them. Um, it's great to hear that some of the panelists have been using them. So thanks very much, everyone. Yeah, so it's been a great session. So everybody, if you could just show your appreciation to the speakers and, um, and you can follow up on the chat. <laughs>